Are you trying to learn x86 assembly for malware analysis or reverse engineering and getting discouraged or overwhelmed? You're not alone. Many people have the same problem. Let me show you how I not only approach learning this valuable skill, but also key points that are more important to focus on. I'm Cerberus and welcome to Malware Hell. <laughs> Assembly language, often referred to simply as assembly and commonly abbreviated as ASM, is any low-level programming language with a very strong correspondence between the instructions in a language and the architecture's machine code instructions. Machine code is any low-level programming language consisting of machine language instructions, which are used to control a computer's central processing unit or CPU. This is literally just data interpreted as code by the CPU. People just starting to learn assembly language find it difficult. There is a logical reason for that. When we look at assembly code from a macro view, it is immediately overwhelming as there are approximately 981 unique instructions with over 3000 variants in the x86 architecture. The fact that x86 is such a vast architecture causes aspiring malware analysts and reverse engineers to stop learning assembly. To be honest, this is to be expected. Who wouldn't be overwhelmed? To understand x86 assembly, we need to be familiar with a handful of instructions. For the remaining instructions, we can use reference material. It's understanding the higher level concepts and zooming in on key areas of importance that will improve our skills. Learning assembly from a macro view will only waste your time and sanity. Knowing assembly concepts at a higher level will enable you to adapt easier to new architectures in the future as well. In order to learn effectively, we must have a look at a level of abstraction below what we wish to learn first on the subject, then a higher level of abstraction after that. For example, if we want to learn assembly language, it is not important for us to know exactly how the silicon chip is fabricated, only how it functions, keeping in mind there will always be exceptions to that. It is not necessary for us to understand every aspect, only the ones at the times in which we need them. This is where we can use reference material after we have those basic concepts. When we find an instruction we have not seen before, and it is not easily handled by our tooling to meet our goal, we must make an effort to understand what is happening. It is important to remember that making assumptions in reverse engineering will get us into trouble. We must constantly challenge ourselves to understand complex problems. When we encounter something we do not understand, we can use documentation. Almost every processor has extensive documentation. Manufacturers typically want compiled code to execute on their CPUs. To do this, specifications need to be made available to software engineers to add compiler support. We can take advantage of this wealth of information when performing malware analysis and reverse engineering. Let's now start at the lower level of abstraction, but only as much as we need to to reach our goal effectively of using reference material. We are going to have a look at the lower level of abstraction, which is instruction structure based on many different points, as well as a higher level of abstraction based on branching concepts, calling conventions, etc. After we have the basic fundamentals, then we will have a look at reference material. So to go over the different components of an instruction, we need to start with prefixes. The lock prefix forces an atomic operation to ensure exclusive use of shared memory in a multiprocessor environment. Atomic operations in concurrent programming are program operations that run completely independent of any other processes. The repeat prefixes cause string handling instructions to be repeated. 
the REP or rep prefix will repeat the associated instruction up to CX times, decreasing CX with every repetition. Rep NE or REP NE and REP NZ or Rep NZ also are synonymous and repeat the instruction until CX reaches zero or when the zero flag is set to one. Rep E or REP E and Rep Z, REP Z are synonymous and repeat the instruction until CX reaches zero or when the zero flag is set to zero. Segment overrides are used with instructions that reference non-stack memory. The default segment is implied by the instruction and using a specific override forces the use of the specified segment for memory operands. The operand size override prefix allows a program to switch between 16 and 32-bit operand sizes. The address size override prefix allows a program to switch between 16 and 32-bit addressing. So mnemonics are memory devices that help learners recall larger pieces of information, especially in the form of lists like characters, steps, stages, or parts. In programming, a mnemonic is a name assigned to a machine function or an abbreviation for an operation. Each mnemonic represents a low-level machine instruction in assembly. Mnemonics like this make machine code easier to read and write for humans. A mnemonic is pretty much just like when you learned in school Roy G. Biv. The next thing we need to talk about is displacement. A displacement value is a 1, 2, 4, or 8 byte offset added to the calculated address. Now it is calculated in a very specific way. Base plus the index times the scale plus the displacement value. The base can be a general purpose register, so can the index. The scale can be one, two, four, or eight. And the displacement value is a constant like we had mentioned earlier. The next thing we'll talk about is immediate. An immediate value is a constant number embedded into the instruction itself, as opposed to one loaded from another place. So in this example, we are pushing the value one to the stack. In this case, the immediate value is one byte. Then we have move EAX FF, so that's one byte. Now that we have covered basic components of an instruction, let's now talk about how these different components look together. An x86-64 instruction may be at most 15 bytes in length. It consists of the following components in the given order, where the prefixes are at the least significant or lowest address in memory. Mod RM is one byte if required. SIB is one byte if required. Displacement is one, two, four, or eight bytes if required, and immediates are one, two, four, or eight bytes if required. Opcodes in x86 are generally one byte, though two byte instructions and prefixes do exist. Mod RM is the byte following the opcode and adds additional information for how the instruction is executed. Where reg specifies a register and r slash m may contain a register or specify an addressing mode, depending upon the value of mod. The SIB byte, or a scale index base byte, is an optional post opcode byte in x86 used for complex addressing. SIB bytes are formatted similarly to mod RM bytes and take the form of scale times index plus base plus displacement where the scale is one, two, four, or eight. The base and index each encoded as a register. The displacement is a constant offset encoded after the SIB byte, which is applied to the final address. Immediate value means the value is included in the opcode, and the displacement is just a constant, of course, that gets added to the rest of the address in cases where there is no component of the address other than the constant, it is still called a displacement. 
This here is how mod RM may be encoded. So if we have a mod of 00, zero no displacement unless r slash m is 110. So 01 will be an 8 bit displacement, will be signed extended to 16 bits. 10 is a 16 bit displacement, and 11 r slash m is going to be a reg field instead of r slash m. You can also see a table here that's provided that let us know which registers are encoded for what, as well as what happens when mod is not equal to 1, 1, when we're having a scale index base or combination thereof, and what those encodings look like. So here we also have a table showing reg encodings and their corresponding 8, 16, and 32-bit representations. So now let's have a look at a few examples. The move or mov instruction copies the second operand, which is a source operand, to the first operand, the destination operand. The source operand can be an immediate value, general purpose register, segment register, or memory location. The destination register can be a general purpose register, segment register, or memory location. Both operands must be the same size, which can be a byte, word, or double word. In our reference material here, slash r indicates that the mod rm byte of the instruction contains a register operand and an r slash m operand plus rb, plus rw, plus rd, plus ro indicate the lower three bits of the opcode byte is used to encode the register operand without a mod rm byte. The slash digit or slash zero that we're seeing here is a digit between zero and seven that indicates the mod rm byte of the instruction uses only the r slash m register or memory operand. Let's now try to encode these examples here. All right, so we are going to use 8B as move register to register. So that's 8B. Then we are going to use the register addressing mode, which is 1, 1. With that, we take EBX, which is encoded as 0, 1, 1 and then EAX, which is encoded as 0, 0, 0. 8, 4, 2, 1, so 8 and 4 is 12, and then 13. 8, 4, 2, 1 is 8, so 13 is D in hexadecimal, and 8, so D8. All right, so now we are going to do move EAX FS register 30. As the, as the offset. If we look in the instruction table here, we can see we have the option here for A1, which is move into EAX, a 32-bit value. That is a segment register and offset. So in our case, we will use the FS override, which is 64, and then we will specify A1. And then we have to specify the displacement, which is hexadecimal 30, however, represented here as 32 bit. That is going to be in Little Indian, so hexadecimal 30 will come next, and then one, two, three null bytes. Our encoding is 64 for the FS override, A1 for the, for the opcode, and then our displacement here. So here are the answers, and we can see that our encoding was correct. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All right, so the first one is gonna be move EAX, D word pointer EBX. So we have 8B again. Then we are going to be using register indirect addressing mode, so 00. zero. Then we are encoding EAX, which is 000. zero, zero. And then EBX, which is 011. 8, 4, 2, 1, that's 0, and then 8, 4, 2, and 1, that's 3, 8B, 0, 3. So move EAX, 0 pointer EBX is encoded as 8B, 0, 3. 
All right, now we are going to be doing move EAX, D board pointer EVX plus four, eight B again for the instruction. Then since we have a one byte displacement, we are going to be using the mod of zero one. And then EAX is of course zero, zero, zero. EBX is zero, one, one, eight, four, two, one, so four. And then eight, four, two, and one is three. So 8B hexadecimal 43. And then we have our one byte displacement, which we will indicate with hexadecimal zero four. Let's do the next instruction. So move EBX as well here. So move is going to be 8B for us here again. Then we are going to be using a one byte displacement. So that is going to be the mod of zero one. And then we have EBX, which is going to be zero one one. And in this case, we are going to need SIB. In our case, we are going to be using one zero zero for this encoding. You can refer to that table that we had earlier. Again, eight, four, two, one. So four and one is five, eight, four, one so eight and four are 12 and 12 is c so 8b 5c then we need to do the sib byte here scale index and base index times eight is going to be encoded as one one the index is ecx which is encoded as zero zero one and the base is edx which is encoded as zero one zero so eight, four, two, one, eight and four is 12, eight, four, two, one. So eight and two is 10, C, A, eight, B, five, C, C, A. And what is our displacement? 32, 32 is going to be hexadecimal 20. So in this case, our instruction is encoded as eight, B, five, C, C, A, two, zero. All right, having a look here, we can see that we were correct in our calculations. So that was instruction encoding. So push and pop. Push decrements the stack pointer, then stores the source operand on the top of the stack. The address size attribute of the stack segment determines the stack pointer size, 16 or 32 bits, and the operand size attribute of the current code segment determines the amount the stack pointer is decremented, two or four bytes. The pop instruction, in contrast, loads the value from the top of the stack to the location specified with the destination operand, and then increments the stack pointer. The destination operand can be a general purpose register, memory location, or segment register. Push and pop instructions are typically used for passing arguments as well as temporary storage. Now let's talk a bit about jump instructions. Jumps are used for both conditional and non-conditional changes in control flow. Other instructions will manipulate the flag registers. Then the jump instructions will read the flag registers to determine if a jump is taken or not. For the flags, we covered those in video 35 entitled Malware Theory, CPU Registers and Flags. Now let's talk about the compare instruction. The compare or CMP instruction compares the first source operand with the second source operand and sets the status flag in the eFlags register according to the results. The comparison is performed by subtracting the second operand from the first operand and then setting the status flags in the same manner as the sub or subtract instruction. The main thing we need to know about compare Again, it compares operands with a subtraction method. It sets the status flags. The ZF status flag is going to be likely the most important for you in your day-to-day -day work. And control flow obfuscation can be achieved with this. So let's take a small example. So if I move the value of one into EAX, then perform a compare instruction of the value two against EAX, the zero flag will always be zero. In this case, the jump will always be taken and code will be executed down here 
all the time. And the code that happens to be in this block is never executed. Since it is never executed, this is something that we usually refer to as garbage code as well as obfuscation. Now let's talk about the test instruction. The test instruction computes the bitwise logical and of the first operand, source one operand, and the second operand, source two operand, and sets the SF, ZF, and PF status flags according to the result. We mentioned, of course, that it's bitwise and. Typically, you are going to be seeing the ZF flag used the most, and it's usually used in general to check return values. So let's say we are comparing two strings together. If that is the case, string compare will return zero. It's performing a bitwise AND against itself. If it is zero, then it will take the jump. So we can see here that if the strings match, it's going to go to this location. If the strings don't match, it's going to jump to this location. We did discuss a bit about the call instruction previously. However, the call instruction pushes the return address to the stack and changes the instruction pointer to the destination operand. Now let's talk a little bit about calling conventions. Calling conventions are a standardized method for functions to be implemented and called by the machine. A calling convention specifies the method that a compiler sets up to access a subroutine. In theory, code from any compiler can be interfaced together, so as long as the functions all have the same calling conventions. In practice, however, this is not always the case. Calling conventions specify how arguments are passed to a function, how return values are passed back out of a function, how the function is called, and how the function manages the stack and its stack frame. In short, the calling convention specifies how a function call in C or C++ is converted into assembly language. Needless to say, there are many ways for this translation to occur, which is why it's so important to specify standardized methods. If these standard conventions did not exist, it would be nearly impossible for programs created using different compilers to communicate and interact with one another. There are three major calling conventions that are used with the C language on 32-bit x86 processors. These are STD call, CDECL or CDECL, and fast call. In addition, there are other calling conventions typically used with C++ called this call. Let's learn about each of these calling conventions together. CDECL stands for C declaration. It passes arguments from right to left, and the return value is stored in EAX, and the calling function cleans up the stack. So here we can see in the example, our function simply adds two integers together. So from left to right is A and B. Since arguments are from right to left, it will pass B first, then A. So you can see B is going to be three, A is going to be two. We go ahead and call the function. Then inside of the function, we have our prologue and epilogue, as we had discussed in a previous video, and the parameters are pulled off the stack and the operation is performed. Please note that the calling function, which is the function that called the function underscore function, will clean up the stack by performing an add instruction to the ESP register of eight. Next, we have STD call or Win API. It's a Windows 32 API standard. Arguments are passed from right to left. Here we have B, which is going to be three, A, which is going to be two, a call to the function. Then we have our prologue and epilogue and the same operation is performed. Please note that the ret or return instruction with the immediate value of eight We'll clean up the stack. We are going to be seeing STD call used when calling Windows APIs. So it is very important to understand this calling convention in regards to malware analysis if you're working with the Windows operating system. The next one is fast call. 
Arguments are passed as registers. It does not always need a stack frame. Arguments will be in the order of typically EDX, EAX, ECX. It can be ambiguous depending on the compiler. So in the example here, parameter zero is gonna be in EAX. Parameter one is going to be in EDX. We are going to call the function. It's going to go ahead and set up the stack, perform the operation directly on the registers, and the return value is stored in EAX. It's going to then return, and that's it. No stack cleanup here required. Next is this call. A pointer to a class object is usually passed in ECX. Arguments are right to left, and the return value is in EAX. So here we can see we are moving address of class zero into ECX. We are pushing the arguments to a method that is within that object, and then we are calling that method. All right, let's now have a look at the reference material available to us. Now that we have a better level of understanding, we should be able to navigate the reference manual more effectively. So here is the daunting reference manual. Let's have a look at the instruction format. Here we can see pretty much the same diagram in which we were using earlier, as well as the instruction prefixes. If you remember, we saw the FS segment register override prefix, and we had used that. And also we can now start having a look at our instructions. So we had a look at the move instruction a lot so we can go into the chapter 4 instruction reference for M2U and under instructions of MOV or move and you can see here 8B and slash R which is what we used and more information and a description of exactly what that instruction does. It will also include more information regarding exceptions and use of the segment registers, as well as if you were to implement this in emulation, they do have logical explanations in, I guess, pseudocode to explain how the instruction works at a fundamental level. It is also possible to sync up these reference manuals with your decompiler or disassembler this will perhaps be something we do in a future video. We have covered basic x86 assembly language principles from a lower level of abstraction to a higher level of abstraction. As a result, we can better understand concepts covered in the x86 reference manual. In the future, when we encounter instructions we don't understand, we can refer to the reference manual to enhance our understanding in turn, improving the quality of our reverse engineering efforts. Additional links and resources can be found in the video description. All right, folks, that's all I have for you today. If you do have any questions or comments, leave them below. If you like this video and wish to see more like it, please subscribe. As always, stay curious and have a wonderful day. Thank you.